Many people, myself included, have thought about how Tesla's full self-driving and their Optimus robots are basically identical, but in a very significant way I don't believe they are anymore, and I want to explore that. Let's take a look. Hey y'all, it's Dr. Know-It-All coming to you from my, my father's office. <laughs> it's a little bit of a sad uh, thing, you know, to be up in Washington, D.C. area now that uh, it's no longer, I guess it's his former office at this point. Anyway, if you don't know, he passed away about a week ago, and uh, it was... You know, everything is generally for the best, but we're here taking care of things, and so I'll be around for the next week or so, and then there's a memorial service later. But anyway, I want to talk about an idea that first popped into my head while Scott and I were talking to Suzanne Gildert with Sanctuary AI. And if you haven't seen that video yet, I'll leave a link to it up here and also at the end of this video. It is it's highly worth watching. But anyway, Suzanne was talking about their robot and sensor fusion and everything, and I realized it kind of you know popped into my head, and you'll actually, if you watch that video, you'll actually see me go like, wait a second. I, I realized that, that there was a significant difference between full self-driving, the, the compute behind it, the neural networks, all of that kind of stuff, and running a humanoid bot or most other applications including things like ChatGPT, Sora, etc. And that primary difference really comes down to use case. So most of these other things like ChatGPT or something like that is a use case where something can be relatively effective most of the time. In other words, you ask ChatGPT to help you write an email to somebody or something like that. And let's say it does it nine times out of ten fairly well or 90% of the email is really good but you have to go back and edit it. That is perfectly fine for something like ChatGPT. Also, as it turns out, as I started thinking about this, it's also fine for humanoid type robots or human scale robots. It's fine for things that are moving at relatively slow speeds and can get into an unusual situation that it doesn't quite understand and it can actually stop and pause. And it's also fine for programs like ChatGPT and others to take more time if they need to. This is actually sort of at the cutting edge of this kind of research is giving these large language models more time to think in order for them to be able to come up with more concise and appropriate answers to difficult questions. So that is also something that you have access to if you're using a large language model, not necessarily as consumers because we sort of get it spit back as fast as it does, but in research areas they're looking into allowing more time for critically important or difficult questions or things that it has to create. But you might argue that that's not embodied AI and it's actually different with embodied AI, but my argument would be that it actually is relatively similar. It's not the same thing, but it's relatively similar in a humanoid type bot that is operating at normal walking human speeds. So the most important part is actually the second part, which is that a humanoid bot operating in, in a factory situation or at your house or wherever this future humanoid bot will be can actually take a moment if it needs to. It's sort of like you. If somebody asks you a deep question or if you walk into a room and the situation is kind of weird or something like that, you can look around, you can take a few seconds to process that, and then you can come up with an answer or then you can figure out how to navigate a new environment that is different than you expected it to be. And of course, secondarily, just like a large language model, if the robot gets most of it right but it's not quite, quite right, it's actually probably okay. Now, it's not great in terms of a factory. You know, it might actually drop a piece or something like that. But that's not the end of the world. I mean, especially if it's designed so it can, you know, bend down and pick the piece back up again and put it back where it was supposed to be. So in these sorts of situations, mistakes and more time are much, much more acceptable than they are in full self-driving. And that is why I believe that having more sensors in a humanoid bot, and in particular, we've seen this happen with Tesla's robot Optimus, they've put pressure sensors into the pads of its fingers, at least the latest that we've seen, and that allows it to have more different kinds of inputs than just cameras, which can be very, very effective for a humanoid bot, of course, right? It's nice to be able to feel whether you're picking up something a little bit squishy or something that's really, really hard-sided, especially if it's something where you're trying to very carefully manipulate it. But that is a source of sensor fusion issues. You could look and see something and feel something different. There also will eventually be auditory inputs, I'm sure, whether or not it's there in some robots it already is, but that means that you're hearing input as well as seeing and feeling and potentially other sources of input as well. For example, with many humanoid bots, not including Optimus, and I don't expect Tesla to ever put this in there, but they have LiDAR in many of these other humanoid type robots, and that actually in my mind is okay. It's expensive and that's kind of a downside to it, but in terms of sensor fusion, it's not that big of a deal. When something is moving at just a meter or two per second and doing relatively slow motions, there's a lot of time to take in many different input sources and to kind of, you know, <laughs> to mull it over, to think about it, for these bots to be able to 
consider different possibilities, to even take a break just to pause for a second and think about it and kind of have a voting system going on between different types of inputs to determine what the best course of action is and what the ground truth actually is if there's disagreements between these types of inputs. And especially when there is so many different types of controls on the output end of things, in other words, you can move your fingers in different ways, you can move your arms in different ways, you can walk, you can move your upper body, you can turn your head. There are many, many different output channels to a humanoid bot, and the bot has to interact with the world. Scott talks about this all the time. He's like, the bot is designed to interact with the world, whereas a car is not designed to interact with the world. It's supposed to not interact with the world. Having many different modalities of input is actually very, very valuable because it can help the bot to interact with the world in a sophisticated way like we humans do. We have, you know, five senses, actually six with proprioception. So we actually have quite a few senses and we have a lot of different inputs coming in and we fuse those inputs and it's okay because of the kind of speed that we're operating at, which is generally, you know, human standing, walking, whatever kind of speed, maybe running or something along those lines. So we, we move relatively slowly and there is some forgiveness. If you trip and fall down, it's not the end of the world, generally speaking. And if you drop something, you can go and pick it up. And if you have to pause for a second to again, take in a new environment and sort of interact with that environment in a novel way that you're not used to, you can do those sorts of things. You can add to the cognitive load, take more time to do a new task or to enter a new environment and interact with it in a safe and effective manner. So now let's move on to vehicles, to a car. A car is a very, very different thing. It has only three channels of output and maybe two, depending on how you want to put it, but steering wheel, which can go, you know, <laughs> clockwise or counterclockwise and acceleration and braking. That's pretty much it. That's all it's got. And like I said previously, the whole point of this thing is to not interact with the world. The point is to stay away from everything else except the ground. <laughs> so you're touching the ground. So you're clearly interacting that way. But generally speaking, you want to not interact with the universe around you. You don't want to hit a person. You don't want to hit another car. You don't even really want to hit a paper bag if you can avoid it or a squirrel or things like that. So there are levels, right? Obviously you would rather hit a paper bag or a squirrel than a person, but generally speaking, you kind of not want to hit anything is the basic goal of driving, whether that's a human being or autonomous software. And then let's add to this that you don't have that extra time if you want it. If you're driving a car at any kind of speed, you know, 35 miles an hour, 70 miles an hour, any of those kinds of speeds, you have to react fast enough not to interact with the world. You can't go like, hold on a second, let me think about this. This is weird. I've got sensor fusion issues and these two things are arguing against each other and how am I going to have the vote come down and make a decision on this? You just don't have that time. The car or a human being has got to decide very, very rapidly what the correct decision is or at least the best decision given the circumstances and it's got to act on that. So as you can see here, it's fundamentally different. Something that's operating in a human scale like a human bot or you know a person even or something like that has very different tasks in front of it than does something like a car. A car is moving at much higher speeds, has much simpler output controls, and the whole goal of a car is to not interact with the universe around it. It wants to avoid that interaction. Whereas a humanoid robot is moving relatively slowly, it can pause if it needs to, and if it makes a mistake, as long as it's not a drastic mistake, it can recover from that mistake. So this is a very different use case, and it's something that you know I have to say that I hadn't really kind of connected it up in my head, but it's an importantly different use case in terms of sensors. For a vehicle like a Tesla, you need to have something that can make a decision very, very rapidly under normal driving circumstances, right? It doesn't have to be absolutely pitch black. It doesn't have to operate in the worst blizzards ever or a gigantic typhoon, you know, thunderstorms or things like that. As long as it can operate under normal conditions with relatively good lighting and relatively good weather conditions, it is fine. That's the whole goal of this thing. But what it has to do is make decisions super, super quickly, and it has to be very confident about those decisions. It can't second guess itself. Whereas something along the lines of a humanoid bot, which is moving much more slowly, and again, it could be in highly variable conditions eventually. I mean, it could be an outer space asteroid mining eventually, right? But a bot that's operating at that sort of level and with this many output controls, with all kinds of different output controls and ways of moving its body, it needs more different types of inputs. It needs more multimodal inputs in order to understand the universe as well as it possibly could. And it can make that trade-off because it's not only moving slowly, but it can also pause if it needs to and make a decision. And if it's not 100% perfect, it can correct for that as long as it doesn't make any kind of like terrible mistake. Obviously, you don't want the bot flailing its arms around really quickly or something because then it could hurt somebody. But basically, as long as it is behaving in a relatively sedate manner, 
it can take its time and make decisions, and if it makes a mistake, it can correct for that mistake. And again, this is very, very different than a car. So for a car, I think Tesla has made the right decision. Put cameras in the car and depend on cameras and an inertial measurement unit. But don't add to the complexity. Allow the car to understand the world under, again, 99 point whatever percent of use cases, which is, again, not absolute blizzards, not absolute huge thunderstorms and things like that. And if those conditions exist, the car can pull over and can just stop for a while. It can be like, can't operate under these conditions sorry but for most normal conditions cameras are adequate for it to drive around and for it to interact with the world or not interact with the world in the proper manner but for a humanoid bot the use case is very different right it's it needs to be able to interact with the world in a very sophisticated way again with its hands its feet its legs its arms etc etc it needs to be able to interact with the world in a sophisticated way and it has many different output controls not just three but you know on the order of 50 60 something like that depending on how you want to count it there are many different output channels so it needs to have more modalities of input and information for it to be able to operate more efficiently so in short what i'm saying is that cars it actually makes really good sense to have a car be controlled only by cameras and nothing else but for a humanoid robot it makes a lot of sense to have more modalities of input for these types of robots for them to be able to interact in a more sophisticated way with the world and it just comes down to the fact that we have very very different use cases cases for these two types of robots. All right, those are my thoughts on the topic. What do you think about it? Should cars actually have more modalities of input controls, like things like LiDAR or radar or things like that? Or are cameras adequate? And do you think that humanoid bots should depend only on cameras or should they have more modalities of input different from a car? Let me know in the comments what you think and I'll see you in the next video. Bye-bye.